Manuela Kropp from Helenka in Germany, Anto Erola from Elect Alliance in Finland, Ale Silvello from Fridays for the Future, and Ash Bombal from Trade Unions in Norway. I'm going to start with a few remarks of my own. I'm going to try and keep them as short as I can because our time is limited today. First of all, I want to stress the seriousness of the climate crisis, the gravity of what faces us. Secondly, how the ideas of the left must be involved in the fight back. The ideas of system change, of deploying the ideas, the intellectual and the technical power, and the traditional knowledge of all the people to protect and transform the planet. In contrast to the capitalist greenwashing and money making from the crisis, we don't think capitalism can or will solve this problem. I want to talk also a bit about the protection of the rights of women and children and workers in this crisis. I want to talk about the importance of food and water and the protection of our access to them and the importance of social organisation for crisis events. So 2019 is going to be marked as the year when the fight for the earth came to gain fresh priority amongst whole sections of the youth, especially amongst the school students, amongst the scientific community and amongst the section of politicians. Green issues were reflected in public discussion, in election results, in public demonstrations and public declarations. Even our currently dysfunctional House of Commons in the UK declared a climate emergency. This emergency has been growing for decades and now the danger is imminent. There is, as the young protesters said, no climate, no climate, no plan B, plan B. We can't escape to a new planet. So every human faces one of the greatest challenges in human history. But never before has technology and education been as great. The solutions to all these problems are available. They just don't make profit. As socialists, we salute those who have been working on this issue for years and must show them respect. In, in the UK in particular, we would mention the anti-fracking nanas, the grandmothers who continue to fight fracking year on year a fight still not won. Extreme weather and unpredictable weather are upon us already. Surface temperatures for June 2019 are already beating all records. But the ideas of the left matter in this. We have a view of how things should be to guide us in our political work. And I want to refer back a long time to the left of the English Civil War. In the words of, Graham, of, of Win Stanley, the earth was made a common treasury for the relief of all, both beasts and men. We too demand that the earth belongs to the people, to the living creatures, to our interconnected dear system. When we speak of system change, a change that would facilitate the planning for the disruption that will come to protect people, including the poor, planning industry to restrict emissions, unleashing technological responses, a Lucas plan of change, defending workers and planning transitions, and measuring our success not by growth, but by human and natural well-being. The need for direct action is clear, for agitation within the communities, for citizens' assemblies and more. We applaud the energy of Extinction Rebellion, but disagree that Extinction Rebellion can be fought as non-political. It is profoundly political. We too declare a climate emergency, not with a sense of hopelessness, but with a steely determination to change this, to reclaim our future. We on the left will challenge the powerful forces who profit from the use of fossil fuels or who use reckless production methods and ruthless extraction methods. We challenge both governments and corporations who are negligent. Negligent. Both governments and corporations could be improving 
matters now by insulating homes, extending green spaces, improving public transport, investing in and extending green transport. We challenge too the governments and corporations who ruthlessly rip out forests and in projects like the tar sands fields despoil the land and poison our water. We salute still the people of Standing Rock who from 1960, 2016 fought for the environmental integrity of their land. No one can do this alone, so we have to embed it within our parties. We have to approach, extend our approach to social movements and work out how to work together in dignity. We have to approach this with optimism. We see a new generation coming into the struggle and boy, can they organise. In the unions, we should be at the forefront of work as to how industry can be transformed. We look to the Lucas Plan from 2000 to 1970s, where workers in the armament industry showed how they, their factories could be transformed to socially useful production. We need that spirit again. But we will not have our communities laid waste by mass unemployment. We have to harness the technological knowledge of the workers to produce effective alternatives. We've got to be the answer to the people who proclaim we are doomed. We don't like the attempt to spread social disruption by publicly blaming individuals for declining to go vegan or to use plastic. We've got to be the counter to the pessimism and say a better world is possible. We need to work for democratic planning, for climate events, for storms, floods and earthquakes. Cuba shows us the way in this. In Cuba, their planning for emergencies outmatches all else. We've got to be demanding that such plans are implemented in our own areas. We should be the health and safety reps of the communities if we get the chance. We need to study direct action, we need study and direct action, organisation and planning, clear political demands and electoral work. I'm going to leave my contribution at that point to make space for the experts who are going to tell us in detail. But I'll end by saying that this is real political work to be done the week you get back. And if you don't know what to do, go to some of the meetings and ask you but take the ideas of socialism with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Manuela Brock from the Inca in Germany. Manuela. This will be. So thank you very much. My name is Manuela Brock. I'm a member of the German party of the Inca. I'm also a member of the trade union in Verdi and I work in the European Parliament for the member Cornelia Hans, who comes from the coal region in Germany. <coughs> I, will give you, I will give you a brief overview of two important position papers which were recently adopted by the left group in the European Parliament, then a brief overview of the energy policy at European level which was adopted in 2018 and at the beginning of 2019. And then I will make some short proposals of what can we do about it. So in April 2019, before the European elections, the old political group of UAGL, now UAGL is the group where the members of the different parties in the European Union are represented, if, if they manage to get elected. They adopted finally a climate emergency manifesto, which um, comprises of most important political demands. So here you see the uh, manifesto says that a just transition must be at the heart of climate action. That means whatever we do when it comes to energy policy, uh, we have to take the trade unions with us and nobody must left behind. Of course, we have to alleviate energy poverty, which is the rising problem in the European Union, because it's not acceptable that prices for energy are rising, especially for electricity, because wind and sun are for free. So why are the prices rising? So the UE AGL fights to ban disconnections, so that even if people cannot pay the, 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 
due by the energy supplier. They must not be disconnected because energy is basically the right. Then you see we demand, of course, a higher target for greenhouse gas reduction for the whole European Union. The proposal, the proposal by the Council is 40%, but it's necessary to reduce it at least by 65%. Um, yeah, here you see we need a full fossil fuel phase out by 2030. We need to increase the investment in renewable energy massively. And of course we have to sorry, we have to properly fund social resources. And what we have to do in the energy sector, we have to do the same in the transport sector because the transport sector is one of the only sectors which where the, the greenhouse gas emissions are rising still today. We have to promote the socialization, that means the re-municipalization re of the energy sector because I will show you later on that the private investment in renewable energy and also the investment by community energy is not sufficient at all to meet our targets. So here, here you see another demands. It's a, it's a long presentation and I want to be here. brief because I don't have uh, we don't have enough time. So you might have realized that our political group changed a lot. Um, after the elections we lost 10 seats, but we might have a new political uh, group in our in our political group in the parliament, which is called Swiss. And they drafted the 10 key demands of the Google AGL, which will be like the political program of the Google AGL for the next years. So they took the leading part, and then the whole uh, political group of AGL adopted this document. Um, so you see that these demands open up the space to become more active for the state. The state, we need a, a green deal at European level, we need green planning. For this, we need to use the European budget and, of course, the budget of the national United States. So, here yeah, I show you what we're talking about. Now I come to the, to the energy sector and the transport and housing sector, which create most of the emissions. So, you see in this graph um, how the, how the, uh, so the, blue, the, the blue graph is how the greenhouse gas emissions actually Developed. And you can see there the figure 40, which is the 40% target of the council. Climate justice organizations tell us this target is not sufficient at all to meet the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement, so we need much more reduction. And to meet this target of 80%, you see below there, and even 95%, because we want to be a European, a European carbon neutral by 2050, you see how steep. The graph is evolving. That means we need much more reduction than we have already done. It means we need much more effort and ambition. Here, just look on the right hand side, where come the greenhouse emissions from? You see the green part, this is the energy part, the combustion of fuels, and the green one is the emissions of transport. So you see transport and energy generation, this is the important thing. This is the electricity mix of the European Union in 2016. Sorry that I don't have uh, more current figures, but they are similar for today. So you see in the electricity mix, it's one third is renewable. It's only one third. And you have to know energy consists of two parts. One part is electricity, the other part is heat. So when we look at the whole energy mix, the picture gets much more present than the same. Here you see if you take the whole energy mix for the European Union, it's only 16, 70%. Here you see, it's not, it's not I mean, I can, if you want, I can send you the presentation afterwards. You just see how different the national energy mixes in the different member states are. The light pink is renewable energy. So in the first line, you see the mix for the whole European Union, and then you see the different member states. A good example is Denmark. Yeah. 
but you see how the is also included, it's not even easy, but I think you see it has a big share of renewable energy because it's geothermal repeating. So, the problem is that the problem is that the problem is that the problem is that the member states have the competence to choose their own energy needs. So we have legislation at European level and the member states are asked to, to fulfill these obligations and the targets, but they, they can do it on their own and to choose the needs to be met. So here I just summarized what's happening now at the legislative level in the European Union. These are the targets set in the so-called European Energy Union. It's a, it's a famous buzzword. It was one of the ten European priorities of the Union Commission. And I just wrote down for the targets, you see, and then the brackets, uh, which which targets we really need to, to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement. So you see, for greenhouse gas reduction, it's not enough. It must be specified. For energy efficiency, it's not enough. For renewable energy, it's not enough. There's only one good thing, it's the governance regulation which uh, obliges the member state to present national energy income. So now something I found in a really interesting paper of uh, the trade unions for energy democracy network. And this is really alarming. Actually, the investment in re re new renewable installations is falling in the European Union. So you see a peak in 2011, yeah. you see 137, and then it's becoming lower and lower. And the reason is, the member states, after 2011, the member states changed the, the support schemes for renewable energy, and immediately the investment fell. So the question is, how can we, how can we achieve a higher share of renewable energy? This change in support schemes was an initiative by the European Commission, it was heavily criticized by the UE NGL and the Green Group in the European Parliament, but uh, yeah, because we need the majority and the political power, we had to accept it. So it was supported by the European Commission and the Conservatives and the Liberals. So what they do is they cut, this is really absurd, they cut the emissions for uh, energy, sorry, the subsidies <coughs> for renewable energy. But at the same time, they keep, at European level, the European legislation, they keep subsidies for nuclear energy and fossil fuels. So here, yeah, I have a list. It's a, yeah, like capacity mechanisms, subsidies, we have a Eurotone treaty, subsidies directly from the European budget for gas infrastructure projects. And also the state aid, which is allowed by the European Commission for the construction of nuclear power plants. The problem is, in the electricity network, you have only a limited space. So if you keep subsidies for fossil fuels and nuclear and allow them still to be in the electricity grid, there's no space for renewable energy and there's no business case for renewable energy. So as long as we have these subsidies, it will not be possible to, to get a higher share of renewable energy. And yeah, in June, quite recently, the European Commission assessed these famous national energy plan plans, and the result is only one third of the member states will meet its own targets for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and greenhouse gas emission reduction. The rest will not meet its own targets. So, the targets are not ambitious enough, and even these non ambitious enough targets are not met. So, the question is where does this lead us? Yeah, I have some figures from the transport sector, the rising emissions, um, and, it's, and it's clear that we need a reduction in the individual transport, because these famous electric vehicles, which is part of the new strategy of the um, European Commission and also, for example, of the German government, it's, uh, it's not an alternative if you take the life cycle assessment of the electric vehicle, you see it, that it's, even, it's less ecological than a, than a normal car. An, an electric vehicle has to run 100,000 kilometers to become more ecological than a normal car because of all the minerals and materials that you need to uh, build in the batteries. So what you need is an expansion of public transport. 
and here I mentioned already the same for the housing sector. The housing sector buildings produce a lot of CO2 emissions and it could save a lot of CO2 emissions just by refurbishing and insulating buildings. And of course with this we could uh, decrease energy poverty because the poorest people live in the, in the poorest houses. So what can we do? There is already, fortunately, in three member states of the European Union, something which is called One Billion Climate Justice <coughs> Campaign. It's a, it's a network of trade unions, climate justice organizations, and other stakeholders. Let's create one million jobs in renewable energy, in the agricultural building, and in the public transport sector. Uh, public transport sector. And what they do in these documents, they really check the figures like how many uh, billion of euro do we need to invest, um, how many jobs could we create, and what could we do with jobs like, for example, in the coal industry or in the gas industry. The same was presented by, not the same, but something similar by the German Trade Union Federation. This I skip the question on the need to end austerity policy. Here I mentioned some good proposals at European level for the research framework program and the multi energy framework, but it's not enough. One example I want to mention is uh, Scotland. Scotland had already a transition to uh, renewable energy. And actually, there the workers and trade unions were promised that uh, millions of thousands of jobs will be created in the renewable energy sector. So the trade unions said, yes, let's do it. And now they published a report of the promises, which you also find on the website of the Tour Network, and there it turns out that yes, they have a lot of renewable energy generation in Scotland, but the installations are not built in Scotland but somewhere else in other member states or even outside of the EU. And the workers who are uh, necessary to maintain these installations, they often come from other member states or even from third countries outside of the EU, and they are not even paid minimum wage. So these trade unions say, they are thinking very much, we have the transition now, and, and what's the result? So we have to take care that when we, uh, uh, when we uh, pursue the, the German transition, towards a social, ecological way of generating energy, <coughs> the production of the installations need to be local. So, and uh, my last point, uh, maybe <coughs> you heard that the German government um, promised to phase out coal, because Germany relies heavily on coal like Poland, to phase out coal by 2038. And what they did for the four coal regions in Germany, they promised 40 billion euro to manage and tackle the structure change, which is good. But the problem is, and this is um, reflected in the study by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, they did interviews with workers in the coal mining regions, workers in the, in the coal sector, and they said, yeah, yeah, it's nice that you, that you bring a billion of euros, but we want to get it good. We, we, we want to be part decisions, what, what, should we, what should we produce? We want to make sure that also money goes to um, small scale projects in the civil society. So when we pursue the transition, we have to make sure that the civil society is in work and that it's, that it's not just a top-down process, because otherwise people will feel left behind even if they don't lose their job. And my last point that comes is I just want to mention again the trade in energy the, the Network Trade Unions for Energy and Democracy, which is a, a really valuable partner for us and which shows that ecological issues and social issues go together. These are trade unions who fight against the climate crisis and who fight for climate change. Thank you very much.